Good morning, Creston. Please join us in the call to worship today. All who come, near and far, come, come and, and worship. worship. All who thirst for God, come, come and, and worship. worship. All whose hearts are filled with gratitude and hope, come, come and worship. worship. All whose hearts are filled with doubt or despair, come, come and, and worship. worship. All who long for your kingdom, come and worship. Welcome to Worship Creston Church. It's so good that you've been able to join us. We've been praying for you as you've been gathered for worship in all your different watching and listening places. We pray that you will have an encounter with our living God. The good news for us today is that our living God is right here in this place and he's right there wherever you are watching and listening. If this is the first time that you've joined us for worship, welcome. We're glad you joined us. You may find out more about Creston Church by visiting our website, crestonchurch.org. Today, we continue to consider the latter portion of the book of Genesis. These accounts provide us stories and background and information about the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We hope that these portions of God's Word will encourage you in your journey of growing in faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, on this first Sunday of the month, we have the special privilege of gathering around the table to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. May God give you his rich blessing as you partake of this meal. You'll want to make sure that you have your prepared bread and cup nearby. You can find the order of service for today's worship time in today's email. It provides everything that you'll need to participate fully in our prayers, in our singing, in our listening, and in our gathering around the table. 
Now, as we continue our worship, I invite you to stretch out your hands right now as a very visible sign of receiving God's greeting right along with everyone else who is watching. My friends, our Lord has called us to worship, and now he greets us. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said together, Amen. Please join me for our morning prayer. Loving God, we have gathered to meet you. We have come to listen to you, to seek you, to worship you. You are the beginning of all things, the life of all things. You knew us before we were born. In you we become. In you we live. Loving God, you are here and everywhere, around us and within us. You know our inmost thoughts. In you we hope. In you we live. You are the source of serenity, giving peace that is beyond our understanding. In you we are still. In you we live. Loving God, we live in you. We worship you. Loving God, you live in us. We worship you. Amen.
Please join me in this communal prayer of confession, adapted from the Heidelberg Catechism. Almighty and loving God, we confess that we put our trust in other gods. We honor these gods alongside you and in place of you. Let us take a moment of silence to lay down our idols at God's feet. By the Holy Spirit's power, help us to know you, the only true God, as you have revealed yourself in your word, to trust in you alone, to look to you for every good thing, to love, fear, and honor you with all our hearts. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the assurance of pardon adapted from the Heidelberg Catechism. How are you righteous before God? Only, Only by, by true faith, faith in Jesus Christ. Christ. Even, Even though, though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all of God's, God's commandments and of still being inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction and righteousness and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, and as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is accept this gift with a believing heart.
Our worship also includes our offering, as we have just been reminded once again of God's grace toward us. Our best response is to offer our whole lives back to Him. Offering money is just one very special way that we can do that. During these times of being apart, you may give your gifts using the postal system, or you can use our online giving process, making sure to clearly designate which causes you want your offerings to be shared with. The deacons are very pleased to acknowledge your faithful, continued giving toward the ministries of Creston Church. They encourage you to also consider our special offerings that are listed in the Friday emails. Today's special offering is for the Benevolence Fund. It's a fund managed by our deacons to provide help to those in need, both in our congregation and in our community. Our weekly offering is for the other ministries of Creston Church and our denomination, what God has called us to do as a church in this neighborhood and in our city, and what God has called us to do as a denomination all the way around the world. May God give you his blessing as you give. Please remember to check the Friday email. It contains all sorts of information for you about our church family and about the ongoing ministries of Creston Church, especially as the new fall season gets underway. Even though we're limited in our physical comings and goings, many of you are finding new and special and unique ways to continue serving our God and one another. God bless you for that. I'd like to share some prayer concerns that we've received recently. Whenever I say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. Ken's dad, Ralph, recently fell and broke his hip, and he's doing well after surgery. Please pray for a good recovery and contentment in the coming weeks of rehab. Give thanks for his 91st 95th birthday celebration this past week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Continue to pray for Jane and for Julie, who mourn the death of loved ones, and for Drew, who is recovering from broken bones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please pray for Tim and Emily as they await the birth of their baby before too long. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. If we are willing to pay attention, we can see God at work in so many ways. Be sure to share a God story by sending an email or a video of your special experiences. And now I invite you to please join me in our prayers of the people. O oh God, no matter where we are, where we are going, or what we are doing, we know that we find our help in you, our Lord. You are the creator and sustainer of all that has been made and will be made. And yet, the immensity of creation does not distract you from caring personally for every person in it. We trust in your care for Ralph, for Jane, for Julie, for Drew, and for Emily and the baby. We know that it is true of your care for us, too. You do not daydream or become weary in that care. We thank you that you not only watch over us with diligence, but that you will guide us so that we will not fall, so that we won't even stumble. Whether we are awake or asleep, you are there, sheltering and protecting us from all that would hurt us. We know that you watch over all of our living. You have in the past, and we know that you are now. Your promise holds for the future and for all eternity, and we praise and thank you for that. 
Amen. Hello, friends. Thanks so much for joining me for today's children's message. This time, the grown-ups are watching right along with you. Today, I brought some books with me. Some books for kids, some books for grown-ups, some books for everyone. If I read the very beginning words from some books, maybe you can tell me what the name of the book is is. You ready? In the great green room, there was a telephone and a red balloon and a picture of the cow jumping over the moon. Do you know what book that is? That's right, Good Night Moon. Here's another book you might know. The sun did not shine. It was too wet to play. So we sat in the house all that cold, cold, wet day. Do you think you know this one? You got it, the cat in the hat. Since the grown-ups are listening, let's give them the beginning of a grown-up book to guess. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. You grown-ups are right if you said A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Here's a first line for all of you to think about. In the beginning, can you think of the answer? If you guessed the Bible in Genesis 1 verse 1, you are exactly correct. And if you said it's in the Bible in John 1 verse 1, you are also correct. I wonder how and why we know these beginning parts of books. Do you have any ideas about that? How about if you talk to one of the grown-ups that's watching with you right now while I get something ready? Why and how do you think we know all these beginning parts of books. So, did you have any ideas? I hope so. Here's one idea that I have. I think that we know all these beginnings because we've heard them and read them so many times over and over again. Some of you have been learning Bible verses and making videos for us to watch on Sundays. That's how you learn those Bible verses, isn't it? By saying them over and over again and again until they stick in your memory. The Bible talks about this same thing in one of the Psalms. Psalm 119, verse 11. Here, let me read it to you. I have hidden your word in my heart. Can you say that with me? I have hidden your word in my heart. Psalm 119, verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart. When we hide God's word in our heart, that's how we learn all about God. All about the special people in the Bible. All about our sin and disobedience. All about Jesus who died and came back to life for us. And all about how much he loves us. Those are wonderful things to keep on putting into our minds and into our hearts and into our memories. It's so important to keep hiding and saving God's word into our hearts and our minds. We don't always have to remember every exact word, you know. Sometimes it's perfectly fine to hear a story and then tell it over again in your own words. But we do have to hear it and perhaps even read it for ourselves 
a bunch of times so that we remember it. So here's what I did when I was your age and growing up just like you. Every day, right at the kitchen table after breakfast, we read from our children's story Bible, kind of like this one. Sometimes my mom or dad read the story. And then after I learned to read, I sometimes would read the next day's story. Every single day, day after day after day, we heard God's story from the Bible, starting at the very beginning, and we kept on listening every day until we got to the very back of the book. And then guess what? We started right over at the beginning. That's how God's word got hidden in my heart, by listening and then reading it over and over again. I still keep reading God's word over and over every single day so that it stays hidden and saved in my heart and in my mind. It keeps on helping me know how much God loves me. If that's what you do at your house every day, that's terrific. And maybe some of you could ask a grown-up to help you get started listening to and reading the Bible every day at a very special time. If we read our Bible every day, we'll keep on hiding and remembering it more and more in our hearts and in our minds. Thanks so much for listening, my friends. May the Lord be with you and also with you. It is our privilege to read a portion of God's Word at this time, so I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me and everyone else to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28, we will begin reading in just a moment at verse 10. And now I invite you to join me in prayer. Eternal God, in the reading of your Word, may your Word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. Genesis chapter 28, beginning to read at verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, 
If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and all of that all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was 10 or 12 years old, I had some sort of disagreement with my parents. I don't remember anymore what it was about, but I do know that I was very upset about something or other. My frustration with them lasted all day long, even when I headed upstairs to bed. Very quietly, in the darkness of my bedroom, I got out my little suitcase and I put a few items of clothing in it. My plan was to lay quietly in my bed, awake, until everyone else in the house was sound asleep. Then, since I was so upset, I planned to leave the house and run away. Then I wouldn't have to deal with whatever had caused our disagreement. I did not have much more of a plan beyond getting out the back door. I didn't think about food or another place to go, but somehow just leaving the house seemed like enough of a solution to me. Well, that's where everything ended. I simply could not stay awake until my parents went to bed and were sleeping. I fell sound asleep too, and when I woke up in the morning, there was my little suitcase right there next to my bed. I never did end up leaving home. My parents and I must have come to some sort of reconciliation. You may be chuckling right now about my little running away from home idea. However, this is the situation where we find Jacob in today's scripture. He's on the run, fearing for his life because Esau is threatening to kill him. When we last saw Jacob, he had just made a bargain with Esau for the birthright in exchange for a bowl of red stew. Remember that last phrase of chapter 25? So Esau despised his birthright. Years have gone by since that sale of the birthright. Isaac is getting older, and he realizes that before he dies, he needs to give Esau, his firstborn son, his blessing. But before the ceremony can take place, Rebekah hears about it and makes arrangements for Jacob to trick old Isaac into thinking that Jacob is Esau. Chapter 27 of Genesis fills in all the details of the deceit that result in Jacob receiving the blessing of the firstborn instead of Esau. Now Jacob holds both the birthright and the blessing that is reserved for that firstborn son. No wonder verse 41 says, Esau held a grudge against Jacob, and he said, The days of mourning for my father are near, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Rebecca, in her continued efforts to show favoritism to Jacob, hears about this death threat, and she devises a plan to once again trick Isaac. This time, under the ruse of getting a wife for Jacob, Isaac blesses Jacob again and sends him north on his way to Isaac and Rebekah's relatives in Haran in the region of today's Syria. This is no little spat that's driving Jacob away. He's scared to death of his brother Esau. Even though he's received the blessing, Jacob leaves home with only the clothes on his back, and he's all by himself on this long trek up north. He's running for his very life from Esau, who is angry enough to kill. 
Jacob doesn't even dare stop at anyone's home to sleep at night. He's completely on his own and dependent on his own devices to stay safe. When it gets dark, Jacob simply stops along the road after a tiring day of fleeing. He looks for a safe and out-of-the-way hidden spot to lie down, and he grabs a stone to put under his head for a pillow. Before long, exhaustion from all that running sets in, and he's sound asleep and all alone in the dark. Run away. We all do it. And we run from all sorts of things. We try to avoid facing that stuff that makes us afraid. There's that big assignment for school. It's such a big project, and we'd rather just put it off rather than getting underway with it. We've gotten ourselves into a financial mess, and if we just ignore it, maybe it'll go away. We've had a significant disagreement with someone, but if we stay away from them, and the problems that divide us, we won't have to deal with it or them. We're addicted to something bigger than ourselves. Some kind of drug, pornography, impulsive behavior. We try our best to pretend that we don't have a problem so that maybe it will go away. Maybe. If we ignore the problems and troubles of social, racial unrest and COVID-19, it will all just go away too. We don't have our heads in the sand. We know exactly what sin it is that so easily entangles us. And yet, we try to put our denying heads in the sand, pretending that maybe we're not so bad, really. We've had the sense that God is knocking on the door of our hearts, trying to get our attention. But that's sometimes a scary thing to think about. God wanting to be involved in my life. That could mean losing control of my life. Often it seems like it might be best to run away from all these kinds of things, even if it does mean that we might be all alone to deal with the hard stuff of our lives. When Jacob is all alone in the dark and sound asleep, God sends a dream. There's a stairway that extends all the way from earth to heaven. Maybe it's something similar to those ancient Mayan pyramids in South America with steps going up all the way to the top. Angels are busy going about their business between heaven and earth. And there, at the top of this stairway connection, stands God, the Lord himself, right there in Jacob's dream. While the sleeping Jacob is unable to have any control over the dream, God shows up. There's that ramp, angels, And God right there at the top. What a sight in that dream. And if that sight wasn't enough, now God speaks. The first few words out of God's mouth are words that Jacob has heard before from his father. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac, your grandfather and father. But they are preceded with an introduction. I am the Lord. Jacob has been depending on his own instincts his entire life and really hasn't paid any attention to this God of his father's. He's been trying to take care of things on his own, thank you very much. So just in case Jacob hasn't been paying attention to everything that Isaac has been teaching, Jacob gets his own personal introduction to the Lord. While Jacob is still silent, God gets right to the heart of this encounter, this very special meeting, making his promises. 
Jacob does not get an opportunity to wheel and deal in this encounter. God simply lays out his promises to this runaway. God will give Jacob the land where he's sleeping. God will give Jacob descendants that will be more numerous than the dust of the earth in every direction. God will bless all of humanity by means of Jacob's many descendants. None of these promises are new. Abraham has heard them from God. Isaac has heard them from God. And now Jacob hears them from God. The promises are astounding, but they've become the standard for this family of God's choosing. However, in verse 15, now Jacob hears and receives his own special promises from God, right in the face of all the danger that he's in. I am with you. The runaway Jacob can see God standing at the top of the ramp in heaven, connected to this fearful sleeper at the bottom on the earth. I am with you, connected to you. This first special promise is about presence. But now God promises action. He will protect Jacob wherever he goes, even if Jacob really doesn't know where he's headed on this run for his life. God will keep him safe. God's third unique promise in this encounter with Jacob is all about this place where Jacob is now sleeping. God will bring him back, back to his home after accomplishing everything else that he's promised. And finally, God repeats his first promise to always be present. And from the sense of the Hebrew, he will be present even beyond all of Jacob's journeyings. Presence, protection, and a homecoming. These are God's promises to a sleeping Jacob. No wonder the runaway wakes right up, astounded at what he has seen and heard. Jacob realizes that God is still right there, right in that place along the road. Now this place is an awesome place, the house of God, the gateway to heaven. And Jacob goes back to sleep and rests in that comforting awareness of God's presence. Ancient worship customs include marking special places with a stone. This side of the road has certainly become a special place for Jacob, so he tips up that stone pillow, anoints it, and responds to his encounter with God by making some promises and statements of his own. The Lord will be my God. This stone will be God's house. I will make a tithe of everything that God gives to me. We get a glimpse of Jacob's faith in these words. But will Jacob keep all these promises? It's hard to say, since he qualifies his vow with the word, if. We know that he can be a deceiver, always looking out for himself in order to make a better deal. At the very least, Jacob will never forget this amazing encounter with God and the lifelong promises that he's received. Even though Jacob is devious and a runaway, God encountered Jacob in order to make his forever claim on Jacob, and he will keep on working on his forever plan. Even though we run away from things like assignments, responsibilities, financial troubles, relationship difficulties, addictions, sin of racism, COVID-19 challenges, denial of sin, and the nudging of God in our hearts, God keeps on sticking with us. God keeps on showing up in order to have an encounter with us. Sometimes 
He even waits until we're figuratively sleeping when we least expect him. When we encounter God today in his word, his promises are right there for us. Listen and be blessed by these promises about God's presence. From Isaiah, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. That promise gets repeated in Matthew's Gospel, where he writes, The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And from Matthew 28, verse 20, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. <clears throat> Jesus while he was on earth, along with his Holy Spirit, who continues to live within us, is the ultimate expression of God with us. God's very presence in our lives. God promises protection, too, for us, for all eternity. In Psalm 12, we read, The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. In Psalm 91, this is the promise. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. God promises a homecoming, too. In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Today, we will encounter God at the table of the Lord's Supper. Jesus Christ joins us here in this supper, reminding us of his great love for us, reminding us of his presence through the Holy Spirit, and nourishing and strengthening our sin-healed souls through the bread and the cup. Gordon Wenham writes in his commentary, Jacob's experience at Bethel reaffirmed the promises yet again and brought their fulfillment one step closer. But more than that, Jacob's experience is a model for everyone, reminding us that in our moments of deepest crisis, God is still with us and will eventually bring his promises to fulfillment in us if we trust in him. May God bless you with a profound awareness of his presence and his promises as you encounter him today. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord of creation, you are everywhere. But there are certain places where the dividing wall between heaven and earth feels wafer thin. That notion tempts us to pack up for a faraway pilgrimage to find you. But you meet us where we are. Wake us up to your kingdom of grace and goodness through your presence in your word and sacraments. Amen.
God has just fed us from his word. We've acknowledged his presence both in the sermon and in our song of response. Now we have the privilege to be nourished at his table for the Lord's Supper. You'll want to have your order of service nearby, as well as your prepared bread and cup. So let's begin. The Gospel tell us that on the first day of the week, the day on which our Lord arose from the dead, he appeared to some of his disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Come, then, to the joyful feast of our Lord. So, people of God, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. Let's pray. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his glorious resurrection overcame the power of sin and gave us new life. Therefore we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 my heart, my heart adores you. My heart pours out my praise to you. You are holy, Lord. We give thanks to God the Father that our Savior, Jesus Christ, before he suffered, gave us this memorial of his sacrifice until he comes again. At his last supper, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us therefore join with the church of all times and in all places and profess together the work of Jesus Christ that we remember and proclaim in this supper. Together we say, We shall do as our Lord commands. We proclaim that our Lord Jesus was sent by the Father into the world, that he took upon himself our flesh and blood, and bore the wrath of God against our sin. We confess that he was condemned to die that we might be pardoned, and suffered death that we might live. We proclaim that he is risen to make us right with God and that he shall come again in the glory of his new creation. This we do now and until he comes again. Let's pray. God of all power, send your Holy Spirit upon us that in sharing the bread we may share in the body of Christ that in sharing the cup we may share in his blood. Grant that being joined together in Christ Jesus, we may become united in faith, and in all things become mature in the one who is our head. This we pray together in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The elders of Creston Church have given their supervision for the preparation of the Lord's Supper prior to our service, and they too are joining with all of us in this gracious meal in their own safe places. Now it's time for all of you to make sure that the bread and the drink that you have prepared is nearby for everyone that is participating. Enough pieces of, on a plate for each person in your location and enough cups with a small amount poured out for each person. And I'll prompt you in just a moment when it's time to eat and drink. For those of you who are choosing not to take the communion elements today, let me offer this special blessing to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord has prepared his table for all who love him and trust in him alone for their salvation. All who are sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who desire to live in obedience to him as Lord of their lives, are now invited to come with gladness to the table of the Lord to receive these gifts of God for you, the people of God. You may distribute the bread to each person. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to Christ and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, trust in Christ and you will not thirst. Take the bread, eat it, remember and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. You may distribute the cups to each person. Taste and see, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Oh, taste and see, taste and see the goodness of the Lord, of the Lord. Take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Please join me in celebration with these words from Psalm 103 by saying each phrase right along with me. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, 
who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Let's pray. Gracious God, you have given yourself to us and made us yours. You prepared a table before us, led us to it, and fed us abundantly. Thank you, great God, for your life-giving gifts. Thank you for uniting us with you and with each other, for giving us new life and new hope, and for preparing us to live as your people. May our lives joyfully display our hope in you. In the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Now, people of God, we come to the end of our time of worship together. But before we depart, we receive God's blessing. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit, sit up a little straighter in your chair, reach out your hands to receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.